Hi, I'm Maestro Hamilton, and welcome to another incredible episode of Through the Vine podcast. Today we speak with Tom and Elizabeth Lutz, who are going to share with us personal development through a program that they have created called Thrive that they've been running for the last 15 years and go deep into their ayahuasca journeys. Blue Morpho has been teaming up with Thrive to bring the best of both worlds together, and we talk all about it. Know that you can always come on Blue Morpho Retreats and experience plant medicine with me. You get my proprietary methods of sanctuary with the plant medicines that I make myself at beautiful luxury locations. So check out bluemorphotours.com and sign up for a retreat today. And now to the podcast. There I was. I was three days into the journey with Hamilton and I said, Hamilton, I'd like to see the infinite. I feel like I'm I'm pretty good in the in the in the physical, and let's let's uh, take me to the infinite. And uh, I'm wearing this one of my uh, surf shirts that says in, it's from Infinity Surf in uh, California, and so I'm like, let's go see the infinite. I'm I'm ready for that now. And um, he says, sure, Tom, no problem. And, uh, and the next thing I knew, I was, uh, scared shitless. I went to, uh, uh, it's, it's like this, um, moving, uh, dial of, uh, universes showing up and then saying, look at this and look at that and look at this and look at that. And it went further and deeper and farther. And all of a sudden, oh, no, 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 uh, no, I, I, I mean, I had no idea of how or to travel or track it or anything. And um, like, okay, 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 enough infinite, enough infinite, enough infinite, just, just get me back, get me back, get me, get me back, get me back. And I, the, the, the great thing was I realized how I, when I came back from it all after, after getting scared was I realized that, wait a minute, that's in me. The infinite is in me, I am infinite. I am made of infinity. Infinity is everywhere. Infinity is inside me, outside me, and infinity is everywhere. Oh, and by the way, Tom, did did you see a lot of consciousness there? Well, yes, I did. And uh, so maybe consciousness is infinite too. Wow. Okay. And uh, and and it, did you see God in there? Well, everything was God. So all of a sudden, I'm in this experience of infinity and consciousness and God are all the same thing. And we can name it different. We can try to separate it. We can do this. We can do that. But live with that, Tom. Go ahead. Live with that for a while. The other day I was walking down the street and I said, okay, Tom, so, so you're, you're made of infinity. You're made of God. And, you know, so how would, how would that look like now? And I, and I, also, I said, well, first off, God probably stand up a little straighter <laughs> and be a little more present, a little less in his head, but, uh, an, an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. I, I, I just think that life is so symbolic these days where everything is words and words and words and words and words and words and yet words describe something. They're not the thing. So when you, when you have the experience, that's way different than how to describe something. And the, the descriptions are valuable, but they're symbols and symbols stand for something, but the, but the something they stand for is not the symbol. And I think we get so confused with thinking words are reality. Words are a description of, of something. They're not the experience. The, the map is not the territory. So when you go to the territory itself, the actual experience of inside and you, and you see it for yourself, the game has changed. I agree completely. The map is not the territory. The map is in our brains and the territory is everything that's beyond us and hopefully something we can tap into. After an experience like that in that ceremony, how did you relate to what comes next? How, how did you think about the end of that ceremony? What did it feel like and what was what was next for you? Well, I, I think that the, the question is, what is the context you live your life from? And, and, and the context 
that I think is who are you and who are you really? Okay. You're a father, you're a brother, you're a son, you're a this, you're a that you're you've accomplished certain things, all that stuff. But who are you behind that? And who are, who are you really? So that showed me who I am really and living from that place is an entirely different world reality um, of, of how am I actually embodying being both the water drop and the ocean, being both the specific thing called embodied Tom Lutz, so forth. And then how am I also the, the entire scope of consciousness? It's in me. So I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's not Tom, but it is in me. So how do I live both those things being both the water drop and the ocean, both the specific thing and the whole of it? I think that's a really different context to live from. And it brings with it a conscious, a conscious, a conscience about how to treat things and how to grow things and how to be things and how to talk and how to walk and how to everything, how to conduct relationships. That is an entirely different space. That's beautiful. I want to bring Elizabeth in. Today on the <laughs> podcast, we have yes, two, two guests at the same time. We have Tom and Elizabeth Lutz. Elizabeth, hello and welcome Hi. to the show. Uh, for everybody who's listening, tell everybody about you guys yourselves and uh, what you're doing with Thrive and how you found your way to ayahuasca. Tom and I, for basically our entire adult lives, and Tom's adult life is a little older than mine, <laughs> um, have been working in the field of personal growth, leadership development, you know, working with people to find their best selves. And one of our latest expressions of that, which we've been doing for about the last 15 years, has been a program called Thrive. And it ties right back to what Tom was saying about the core of it is really who you are. So from our perspective, there's who we say we are and then there are all of the behaviors, all of the practices, all of the life that we build around that belief of who we are. Mostly that belief of who we are is unconscious and just kind of develops from the time we're really small. Rarely do we have the opportunity to say, no, this is who I am. And to choose who we are consistent with infinite, with infinite consciousness, right? The highest expression of ourselves. So in Thrive, what we do is we work with people to, one, get really clear about who they are, and then two, to get a set of practices that continually strengthens their expression of themselves in all domains. So when we found you, Hamilton, and came and did ayahuasca, that just so broadened and deepened our own experience of who we are, and therefore our capacity to work with people to do that as well. And what brought you guys to ayahuasca? How did you hear about it and, you know, start to think where you would go to have this experience? We met someone who had worked with you, um, who we trusted a lot. And, you know, for me, I had done ayahuasca a couple of times and I didn't feel like I was done with it, but I wanted to make sure I was going to the right person in the right environment. And I didn't, and so a long period, 10, 15 years went by until we heard about you and the work that you do and the environment you create. Um, and so that brought us to you, um, not once, but a couple of times <laughs> and more to come. Indeed. I, I had done uh, ayahuasca uh, 35 years ago, uh, back quite a while ago. And, um, and it was great and it was uh, all that stuff. And I've kind of did a little bit, um, you know, over the, over the years. Um, but the difference is remarkable when you're with somebody who knows how to guide it and knows how to uh, take it deeper and has been there himself. Uh, that's the thing I think is different is, is the ability to hold the space in a really big way and be able to actually have sanctuary be something touchable and something fathomable and something real in the room. And that, and that, that, that feeling of sanctuary just drives everything so much deeper. 
What I wasn't interested in was having this massive, dramatic thrash of an experience. And that's a lot of what I hear about with ayahuasca. And people like, you know, they, they persevered, right? And they had tremendous, I don't know, my word drama with it. What I wanted, and so I was looking for something that was really genuinely gonna further my growth, further my expansion as a being. And what I got that I didn't know was available was this depth of connection with God and the universe, where I feel so held and safe in a way that I never have in my life. I, I think there's just a there's just so far you can go with psychology and fitness and this and that and the other thing. I mean, and we we press the edge on all those different things, but pretty soon you you really need something that's going to get you behind it all above it all, bigger than it all, however you want to say it, something that really can hold the whole of it and, and, and that you can actually become something other than your personality um, and, 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 and the way you've adapted to life and all that kind of stuff. And, and, I, I, and having, I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s, you know, they'll, you know I did acid and all, all the stuff, but this is uh, just far, far, far beyond um, any of that in terms of being able to develop you as a being, take you from human being into the actual experience of being. Yeah, there's and so we, much that you said that I want to unpack. Elizabeth, I want to go into your experience of God. And Tom, mm -hmm. I want to go back 35 years. So <laughs> first, first, I want to go into Elizabeth's experience of God. Take us into that. What is that like? How did it happen? How did that awaken for you? The awareness? What was the awareness like? Just Tell us that story. Um, I'll, I'll tell two pieces. Um, the first one was, you know, I did not grow up in a religious household at all. You know, I went, I was in a church maybe five times before I was 20. Um, and my dad was very clearly an atheist, really good human being, but an atheist. So I, I, I've always wondered like, what would it be like to have that deep a belief? in Jesus or in God, but I just couldn't get there for myself. Um, so in, I don't know, second or third ceremony with you and you said, bring in anybody you want, you know, it's all good, just call them in. I was like, okay, I'm gonna call in Jesus. I have never gotten what the big deal is about Jesus. It just never hit me. So I was like, okay, Jesus, show me, show me what the big deal is. And, <laughs> All of a sudden, there was like this rush of this golden energy presence that came flooding into my entire awareness. And um, it was overwhelming. It was so huge. It was this experience of infinite compassion and love. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa okay, okay, I get this. <laughs> I can feel this. So that was the first thing. And then just recently, um, in another ceremony with you, um, I, I could feel this separation that I had created between myself and God. Mm -hmm. And this, it, so it was like, oh, I can let that go now. Like the separation, this wall, this edge that I had, it's like, I can let that go. And this feeling of being so connected to God and the universe that everything is okay, that God wants me to be happy. I mean, that was just, and I don't have to pay a price for it. Mm. It was just this extraordinary feeling of, I belong, I'm mm. part of the universe, and God is present for me. That's beautiful. I don't have anything to say. That's just beautiful. I love that. And wow. Mm. Tom, how did you end up with ayahuasca 35 years ago? Who, where what was the set and setting? Who had it? Who was sharing it? How did this come about? It was a shaman friend of mine that I really liked and respected. And, and uh, he was like, let's, let's try this stuff. <laughs> and um, I, <laughs> it was, you know, sometimes you just get in over your head. And um, that, that was one of them. I, I really, 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 really thought I was going to die. And, um, um, 
he was just chanting. I mean, he's he's a very, very, very genuine guy, and he was just chanting and carrying away. And I'm in the bathroom going, "Oh my God, I'm 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 leaving Earth," you know, and um, scared uh, again, scared. And um, I was uh, uh, about to throw up, and it was the biggest, deepest throw up. I I mean, it was uh, I couldn't believe how deep it was. And I, as I threw up, I threw up into my hand and it was a, a like about that big P. of, of, uh, spit and a little tiny green pea in the middle of it. And mm. I thought that is, that's what all that was about. <laughs> and I realized that that, that little green pea was all the, the conditioning I have swallowed about who I am. Wow. And that, and that, that was the, that's the way to be a man. That's the way to do this. That's the way to do that. You got to da 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 And all in one fell swoop, I, um, I, I, I gave it up. And, um, so, but everything since then had not been that deep. Um, mm -hmm. and so I re decided that if I was going to do it again, I really wanted to have it be with somebody who I, knew had been there and back and was really able to navigate the whole space and more. And uh, so that was very pleased to hear about you. Uh, you guys came down the first time you had your experiences and then thought that somehow you could merge thrive with ayahuasca plant medicine and San Pedro. Um, and then you guys came down and actually had that experience and brought people to do thrive and merge it with our plant medicine. Uh, just share that entire story. Just go into it however you would like. Um, you know, we, we have a tribe, you know, we have um, over many decades have built uh, a connection with people who that's just very deep and very real. And um, we, many of us are explorers and we, find things and we bring people along the way. So for us, when we find something, the natural next step is to invite our friends to do it. <laughs> um, and, and there is a, you know, thrive is for us is about being not so much being happy, but kind of being our best self in the world um, and having values, which are, which makes sense in the scheme of the infinite. So to us, the values, like what's available through ceremony and what's available through Thrive are this perfect complement um, of both, you know, connecting with earth, connecting with God and finding ourselves, our best self within that, and then finding a way to live with that going forward. So, you know, we just did... Um, Thrive a couple of weeks ago with a group of 25 people. And there's a depth without really even needing to say anything different. There's a depth of expression and connection that we now create for people that has the whole program itself be much deeper. So when we, you know, brought people to ceremony who and merged in some of the principles of Thrive, that was also the idea that it would be a much deeper connection, a much more powerful experience of healing um, and of connecting so that people could leave that and have a much stronger foundation to live from going forward. I, the, 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 the big, I think, takeaway from uh, Thrive with Medicine is that you can put words around an experience that is impossible to describe. And I think that, as I was saying before, that words are only symbolic, but the better you get at the words, the better you can get at owning the experience, I think. And so we put a lot of, of um, emphasis on people being able to say, what's the inner game going on? Who are you now? Who are you? Who are, who are you really? And, and being able to put words around that in a way that grabs your essence and brings it forth so you can live from that. And um, 
Because so often I think the danger is when people come and they have a really powerful experience and ceremony, and then they go back and they don't know how to put into words and they're not around people who can support that new expression of themselves. And then, and they go into the same habits and practices in their life. It can be really difficult to make real change stick. Mm -hmm. So the combination of, of bringing, uh, of, inviting and asking and encouraging people to find the words to articulate their experience and to say what that means about how they live their life going forward and then have a support structure for that as they go back is really powerful. Like, like how are you going to embody what you felt on ayahuasca? Mm -hmm. How's that going to be actually in your life, a lived experience? The, the, the thing I saw in an LSD and all the different, you know, psychological uh, things, enhancements, um, is that people go back because they can't live it. They can't actually embody what they saw. They can't actually become that space. So the whole idea of merging Thrive with your work is that people can feel the infinite and then bring it into a, a lived life where they can both they can embody the infinite in everyday life and live consistent with that. So I, I, the, the, the infinity that I am, I can have that experience every moment and live a real life, not just be some kind of spaced out dude walking around trying to try, you know, trying to convince people that God is everywhere. We're going to be when you're going through the experiences and uh, sharing that with others, what kind of activities do you share during the day? The ceremonies are at night, but what kind of activities do you share during the day? And uh, how do you help people, you know, gel together and really, you know, I guess community build while, while they're there? A little bit of yoga, a little bit of movement, a little bit of breath work, just so people really stay in their body and grounded we have people talk, right? Ask specific questions that allow people to, in, in kind of a, in a very safe container to articulate their experience thoughtfully um, and be heard. And, yeah. and, it, and it really is that simple, right? A little bit of movement for grounding, a little bit of just sitting, being still, meditating, and expression either, you know, with just a partner, within the group, within small groups. And that just allows people to integrate and embody what they've experienced and set a new foundation to then go into the next one. And we do, we do uh, what we call nervous system training where, where you're working on developing the nervous system. If you're gonna, if, if you really are gonna bring, bring this experience back and embody it, it's got to affect the nervous system. So how do you do that? Well, you mainly do it through eye exercises and balance. So you, uh, again, it's outside of the, of the, of the narrative. It's outside of talking about it, but it's just being able to hold more, hold a bigger reality in your nervous system and eye exercises and balance are the way into that. I think there's a lot of, um, balance training a lot of tendency to focus on, you know, the dramatic or the hard, right? And so people by default will kind of anchor that part. And if you encourage people and direct people to anchor, what was the benefit, right? What was the insight? What did, how did that feel in their body? Then they, and, and integrate that with nervous system work and some breath work and some yoga then there's a, a lot more healthy integration going on in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what they come back with is not a story about how hard it was, but a story about who they are. Yeah. You guys have been doing this for 15 years and before that also in personal development work. What brought you to personal development work and what have you seen as the evolution and trajectory of it You know, in the last decades? Well, I can say what brought me to it. Um, I actually started as a teenager and I just found this program um, that my brother had done and uh, I fell in love with it. I took it um, and then I volunteered at it and then Tom hired me. And that was, you know, so my 
first 15 years was either working, managing programs, helping lead programs for kind of a general population or then for youth at risk. So, and it was, you know, initially it was very mind-based. It was very, you know, just change your mindset, change your world, right? Change your life. And then, but as we went on through, then the next piece was like, wait a second, there's a whole such thing as an emotional body, right? Our emotions matter and how we relate to our emotions matter. So then we did this whole kind of deep dive over the next decade of, okay, what is that emotional body and how do we heal that? How do we live with that? How do we have, you know, really experience the range of what's available in a really healthy way? And then for me, the last, the last two pieces were really my physical body and uh, my spiritual connection. Um, so my whole life was, I'm going to ride over whatever my body needs because I want to get something done. And it was, I was forced into really learning to respect my body and mm. become embodied in that way. So I was like, okay, there's my mental body. There's my emotional body. There's my physical body, you know, and interestingly, the more embodied I got, the stronger and more balanced I was in my emotional body and my mental body. And then the last one to come for me was spirit and really feeling a spiritual connection. So now we work with all four. It's, a, it's really, an, an, the further we go, we see it's, a, it's an integrated dynamic of spirit, mind, emotion, body. That's all one channel that's, in sync and working together. And when you can line those things up, not out of a thought about it, but out of actual experience of being able to touch each of those in and who they are and line them all up and hold them together as you walk down the street or whatever you do, then all of a sudden it's a, a different game and who you are can be a much clearer, um, in, in your actions every day. So many of the work, I work now a little bit more with veterans and a lot of veterans who've been, you know, into, you know, real war situations. It's hard to come back from that, but what they are. And so, and so they're doing uh, some psychedelics. That's great. However, how do you live with it? And how do you live with it as you go back and you line these four bodies up and, honor each of them and then bring them together in, in an integrated manner. And what brought you to personal development and working in it, you know, for, as a career, a lifelong career? Well, I was bored with everything else. I think <laughs> basically, you know, I mean, I really didn't, it, it didn't really honestly make much sense. I, I went to university of California on a football scholarship and that was, you know, really much more about adulation than it was about, you know, anything else. And, and, and I, and I loved it and had a great time, but I got hurt and then I couldn't be that anymore. And all, all of a sudden, all the people that thought I was great, they were gone on somebody else. And so I, I really had to find, and I didn't know who I was. And I realized, wait a minute, you're, you are a function of everybody else's expectations here. And now that expectation's gone and who are you so it took me uh, that was the worst experience that i've ever had in my life was those moments of realizing that identity was gone and no longer could be and then and, and that turned into the best experience of my life because it got me on the path to discovering who i was other than that and every time i get to a certain place in my identity where i think i am something I refer back to that and go, yeah, that's going to go too. So let's just keep expanding here and growing. And so each step of the way has been a, a, a certain accomplishment and then a certain like, yeah, and let's keep going. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really interesting when you started, uh, you know, it was still the analog world. It was the pre-digital world. And now I'm seeing in the health and wellness space, all of the science and technology being thrown at it all the nutraceuticals, all the extra supplement companies, 
the psychedelic renaissance is happening, all these things. What were the techniques and tools that you guys were using at the very beginning of your career and how has that progressed? It was all psychology. That's what mm -hmm. I thought anyway, <clears throat> you know, and they were harsh tools, yeah. right? I, I, mm. it, you know, it was, it was T groups. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, it was like, you're going to hit tables really hard until you break through and sob or, you know, going to shake really hard. I mean, they were just kind of more gross mm -hmm. tools. You know, and there was so much that was not in the vernacular. There's so much now that's in the, in the vernacular. Like if I say mindset is causative now, mostly people know what that means. Yeah. But, you that know, that was new news. That was, that was, yeah. so, that was foreign. That was foreign language. So, so much of it is just, first, the tools are a lot subtler. Um, and second, there's so much that just is part of the vernacular now doesn't necessarily mean that it goes deep, but the concepts are familiar in a way that they were not at all. The, the downside of that for me is people, because people can say it, they think they are it. And mm -hmm. I don't think so. So I, I, I think it's become so common in language now to, to say certain things and so forth um, that I, I think it's um, almost diminished the experience. And there's, again, there's a huge difference between the direct experience and being and and the symbols about it. Yeah, I was in a conversation this morning about that. And I was saying the problem right now is that our mind is so developed and our use of language is so developed that we can immediately create a thought symbol for something and act like the thought symbol is the thing. Yeah. Instead, when that's just a thought, a word, an imagination for the actual experience itself. I always found that really powerful about the ayahuasca shamanism and the ayahuasca medicine practices, because during the day you talk about it, you process, answer questions, but that's not it. That's not right. it. It starts once you've drunk the ayahuasca and you go into ceremony. And that's like yeah. just such a, a big example of the difference. You know, when yeah. you're talking about it, you're comfortable in your ego, in your mind. You're not in the visionary state. You're talking about the visionary state. And then all of a sudden you're actually in it. You know, you're a, a spaceship without a body. You're a cosmic consciousness going through the, the great forces. And I, someone has to confront themselves in that. However, the years with your work, have you helped people find themselves and confront themselves? But by pointing out that difference, the mm. difference between like, you know, Tom saying, you know, I show me the infinite Hamilton. I, I think I'm, I think I'm ready for that. And then I get there and I'm, I'm, you know, really, really, I mean, my best description of it is scared pissless. I was like, absolutely <laughs> terrified. And <laughs> it was, and I was like, okay, okay, because you can say it does not mean you can be with it at all. Oh my goodness. I kind of crawled up to you and it was like, you know, give me mercy on something here. But, um, yeah. The infinite's the infinite. You know, I was 20 something years ago. I'm sitting there with Julio, my teachers, and I'm, I'm saying to them, how do I do this? You know, it's so strong. And they're like, poco a poco, little by little, you know, someday you will know the infinite, you know? And until then, before that, it just felt like getting just barreled in waves, like you're just playing in two big a seas, you know, just getting crushed yeah. over and over again. What was it like when you came back? You came back after that and you said to me, OK, I think I'm more prepared for this. We're going to surf the quantum, et cetera. Walk me through what some of that was like. Take me into the visions with you as you started to gain some. some well, I, I just I just had a, 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 a see, I don't think any I don't think we heal from anything. This, go, this goes back to something more prior. I think people are trying to heal stuff, and I don't think we heal anything. I, I think what we do is we learn to be with it, mm -hmm. and then it becomes part of us. And if we can be with it, then it'll let us be. And mm -hmm. so we, as, as we be with it, we learn, we, we grow. We integrate it because we're able to own it and, and uh, grow from it, and it's part of us. And so when I came back that that second time, I was like, okay, I can be with that level of, of 
infinity. And, um, you know, I hit the next level. I don't know if I can be with it or not, but that's how I'm growing is being able to be with more of the self that I know I am. It showed me a self that I'm learning how to be with. And that self is infinite. And that self is an integrated, coherent whole of the whole chain from God down to Tom. And being able to own that and embody it and actually live with it in a confusing, you know, always dynamic world is, uh, I think, and, 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 and grow from that whole experience and be better because of that experience is all part of the game. Yeah, it's a living, walking, true philosophy and experience and bringing it into our daily life. Elizabeth, going into there, I want to ask you, you, you know, you first came, you had a series of ceremonies, you went home and you integrated those and then you came back. Share with everybody what it's like to, you know, come back to ayahuasca and having had the experience of it. And what were those ceremonies like for you? I think the, the, what was so great about the progression is that I was every ceremony, every subsequent ceremony I went into, I had less fear to work with. Mm. And the less fear I had to work with, the more easily I could integrate and allow the experience to occur. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the first time, it, it, you know, it's a lot when it comes on and there's a letting go that we right. need to do, which is not necessarily my strong suit. So, you know, initially it was just a lot of focusing on breathing and a lot of, you know, so there, but there was a lot of energy just in that process. And mm -hmm. subsequently there was less and less and less that I needed to consciously work on that way so that then I could just go with the experience. And that is interesting to me, this balance between having an intention and allowing, like, I think having an intention is worthwhile but it's also really important to be able to just let it go and allow what happens to happen. So for me, with every subsequent ceremony, I was able to just go deeper more easily. That's beautiful. What was it like experientially to process the fear? You know, some, some people talk about purging fear. We talk about just turning it off, like learning how to just tone it down and move past that part of us for you what was it actually like to address your fears um for me it was just uh um kind of a like a moment of recognition like here it is not but not giving it energy i was like okay there's that's there now let me breathe let me see beyond that you know so just focusing and being with the whole experience, not shutting away the fear or trying to push it down, but not empowering it either. Right. Mm -hmm. So just a simple kind of, yep, that's there. Now let me, you know, focus on the bigger picture. I, I think it, it's, to me, it's, it's like, I, I need to stay abreast with it. Like it comes on slowly. Okay. Breathe be with it. There it is. And then, and then however it moves, I move with it. So it doesn't ever get away from me. I'm like, yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. Yeah. And, and just, so you, you track it and you don't move away. Just like anything, just like growing with anything is you, you, you stay with it and you, um, and you be with it and the better you can be with it, the better it is. It starts to just relax. And as you relax with it, then all of a sudden, you know, the game gets bigger and on, on, on you go. Integration, I think, is a key element to people processing this and bringing it back into their lives. And if they don't do it, it's just an experience that it becomes a memory and goes away. I'm really interested in your guys' idea around integration because you have such a developed practice. For so many people, they're novices. They don't have their own practices, let alone ayahuasca or plant medicine practices either, you know. So when you guys come home from the ceremonies, what is that process like and how do you address it? What kind of tools do you use? Well, I, th I think one thing uh, you realize, you have to realize is that that was an, a gigantic expansion 
and and then it's okay it's natural to have a contraction afterwards a contraction afterwards doesn't mean that it didn't happen or it wasn't worthy or anything else you get back to what works and so what we attempt to bring to uh, your work is practices that actually can hold the expansion open such as yoga such as breathing such as the, meditation. the such as meditation such as the nervous system exercises i was talking about so all those things if you don't change your practices then you don't change anything you've just had another insight and it's and, and it and it disappears into the wind so you really have to change what you do if 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 who you are is going to shift and so i think coming back from those things important to know what you're going to do not make it too big but do make it consistent. Do you, Elizabeth, like so what much, are the meditations you use? I, you know, I am, I am busy, right? So I, um, I love Tom's practice of going and sitting out at sunrise for 45 minutes every morning, and I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but for me, sitting for 10 minutes or 15 minutes when I'm sitting in front of the red light and I just, I breathe, and I um, focus on my who the experience of who I am and my experience in sanctuary. And that I just breathe into for that 10 or 15 minutes. And I feel completely <clears throat> nourished and connected with myself and with God at the end of that. You know, we have other practices. I do some breath work. I do some yoga. I do, you know, we're all about that. But that is the key practice for me since being with you in ceremony that um, keeps me connected in the big picture. Yeah, I've been finding that work's been really whelming recently. That busy really resonates. Just there's so much more, it seems like, to do than ever. So many tasks. And I've just been taking a few minutes, sometimes five, sometimes 10 in the morning when I'm still in bed, just as soon as I wake up and I'm in the between state and really utilizing that to find that centered place and, and be able to go deep just because during the day, I haven't even been able to have five or 10 minutes mm -hmm. to be able to say, oh, I can just use this now to, to create that. I think it's important for people out there to know that your integration comes however you can. It's the commitment you make to it, I think is the most important piece. And our lives are, some of ours, you know, really hectic. And if you have more opportunities, that's, you know, it's great. But you got to use the opportunities that you have. And I tell them, I resonate so strongly with what you say, that you have to change your patterns. You have to change your habits and your rituals. You have to take a, a good inventory on what is fruitful to change. And uh, step by step, little by little. You know, for you guys, what has... What is it like sharing with your friends, sharing with your community, the fact that you've participated in plant medicine and the impact that it's had? A lot of people say that it's really hard for them to talk about it and they're scared of the reactions people will have to them. And so what is it like just to, you know, share these experiences that you've had, you know, in your closest community? I want to tie the last question to this one. So mm -hmm. another practice that we have between the two of us is, is we talk, right? We communicate. We, we are really, really open with each other. And we have a circle of friends that we're really open with. Our, we have Thrive community calls every two weeks or twice a month. Um, and that's an opportunity for people to tap back into our relationship and to express themselves in that really open way in, with, a, with a safe group. And I think so part of what's really important for integration is having connections with people who share that to some degree or who can hear that or who can nurture that. Um, so we're really fortunate in that we have that circle. So, you know, to me, one of the things that is is key for people in integrating is having someone where they can really connect right? And talk about this is how I'm feeling, or I feel like I'm losing track of this, or, you know, you know, just something that that re sparks that experience that they had and that um, sense of themselves, which then will reconnect them to the commitments that they made out of being there. 
I, I think the, the question is, how, how am I going to keep that identity alive? You're changing your identity. When you, when you do ayahuasca, you are going to see a bigger, different self. That, that's it. So are you, are you willing to embrace that and to keep that new self, bigger self, new possibility alive? And how do you do it? So I, I think, I think it's this, it's as is with everything, there's no easy answer on a thing because if you start communicating, then someday you're going to over communicate. And then you're going to get shut down somehow. I was thinking when you asked that question immediately of my Christian friends who I've been uh, friends with for a long time. And, um, and they said, so how you doing, Tom? What's going on? What's new? What have what, what you, what you been doing? I said, well, um, and I made a snap decision. I said, okay, uh, I, so I'm feeling good. I got God pulsing through every cell in my body. And you know that what connects those cells? That's God too. <laughs> And, um, and, they, <laughs> and, and they were like, yeah, well, how you doing with Jesus? And I said, I'm, I'm great. I'm right in there, you know, and you don't read the Bible and yeah, yeah, sure, Tom, you bet. Okay. And then a whole thing changed from there, you know? So I was like, no, 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 I don't know what that, that what, I don't know how they heard it or if I was, you know, sound like I was bragging or whatever. But anyway, I think you've got to run this ride the gamut between saying too much and not saying enough because mm -hmm. you've got to keep the thing alive and have somebody who can really hear you about it at the same time, like Elizabeth said. But we are, you know, we are beings who live in community and we crave a sense of belonging. So anything that threatens a sense of belonging is going to be really hard. So if you know, to the degree that people have a habit of more superficial relationships, then it's going to be tough to open up and share at this level. But, you know, mostly people crave that in my experience, my experience, mostly pe what people want is a real connection. So just kind of put your foot in the water and open the door to, you know, I went and had this experience. It was amazing. Um, I feel more myself than I ever have in my life. And you don't have to talk about, you know, the medicine or the drama or the, right? All you, if you talk about what happened in your heart and your relationship with you, then people want to hear it. Early on in my experience, you know, this is 2001, 2002, 2003. People would ask me all the time. I was, you know, a lot younger and come more open and gregarious about just talking with people on an airline or you're in an airport, you know, and it's a, what do you do? And as a fledgling young shaman out there in the world, so I'd say, you know, say, you know, well, would you like to have a conversation outside the box? As I'm happy to have a conversation inside it, but I'm also happy to have one outside. If you want to speak outside the typical box and I would give them that choice. And that seemed to help too, that they got mm -hmm. to make a choice that we were going to talk about something sometimes stranger than fiction. And yeah. more often than not, you know, everyone was really receptive to what they were hearing, but I also didn't try to force my point of view. I just said, hey, these, these are, this is what's happening. This, can you believe this is happening out there? I had no idea when I was a kid, I didn't even know, you know, these experiences were available. And so I found that people could be more receptive to it. And Tom, I agree, you've got to read your audience and understand, you know, something that's very sacred to you may not be understandable to them. Right. And so, yeah, to share in a way that they can understand. I even found that too, when I spoke with certain Christians, you know, we were having, like you, Elizabeth, direct experiences of Christ in our ceremonies all the time. It just seemed like once you understood the, the idea of that energy, that presence, that golden light, that consciousness was there all the time. And that was very strange to tell people that believed and had tremendous faith, but had never had a direct experience. You know, they had belief and faith their whole life, but but didn't know how to frame the nature of that experience. I think that that's going to be something really exciting to see with the psychedelic renaissance, because this idea of having direct experience of God is becoming more common. Yeah. And when I was younger, no one ever talked about a direct experience of God. You know, they again, it was always belief and faith. And now people are all the time saying, well, I had one. And another one said, I had one. And, you know, it's very real for them. So I'm interested in seeing how the psychedelic renaissance unfolds. You guys have been in and around plant medicines and psychedelics, uh, you know, 
from the 60s through the great prohibitions to now how are you guys seeing the the space the interest etc in this evolution of culture well, I was just thinking that the um, the the phrase we used to have for um, uh, this kind of thing was experiential education, mm-hmm. and um, and and I I still like that because it takes you out of like understanding is the is the booby prize you know that's that's it's important to understand it and important to uh, to be able to language it, but that's a phase along the way to owning it. And to being it and to bringing it in. So the, I think the, the, uh, it's, it's the same question that goes on over and over again. How much is too much and how much is not enough? And what are you doing of everything? So, so as you, as you gain a different identity, you gain a different ability to weigh what you're doing in your life and how you're developing yourself into the next self that you want to be. And, and I, I, I trying to make that be quite a tangible thing and nothing ethereal at all. It's like you are growing, you're carving yourself into reality every day. Who is that guy? Who is that gal? Who are you being in the process of doing that? Because that's what's growing you or not. I, you, Elizabeth, what are you saying? I think we live in times where everything is polarized. And so many things go to the extreme. So I expect that will happen with psychedelics. Right. You know, in a certain way, I think the, I think that both of these things are true. The extraordinary potential of psychedelics is seen. um, And they're so taken for granted that people just dive in willy nilly. So, I think it's likely to get messy in a lot of ways. Um, I think they're really powerful tools. Um, but I think the what's most important is the space that's created and the navigation that is provided as opposed to the actual plant themselves itself. Like what, what are you using them for? And that's, that's the important thing. That's why I say, who are you? So in, in the, it's the who are you that answers that question of why am I doing this? There's no thing out there that is going to solve everything. <laughs> you know, we have to bring ourself, evolving ourself fully to it and then use yeah. our resources wisely. It, it is never enough. Us mm. is enough. At this point in your life, what's your message for humanity? For the whole world, oh, what message would you want to give to the whole world? Yeah. You're speaking to the whole world right now. What what is your message? Okay, I'll 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 take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll ask for a lot of sanctuary here. Um, I heard the other day there's 186,000 million stars in our galaxy. And that there's more galaxies than all the grains of sand and all the beaches of the earth. In other words, we have no idea. It's infinite out there. I heard Deepak Chopra the other day say, the density within is the same as outer space. It's infinite inside, it's infinite outside. I think humanity is scared to death. And, and basically everything is acting out an inability to be with their own life, with my own life, your own life. So mm-hmm. my advice, sit down, shut up, and just <laughs> sit there for a while. Damn it. <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, my version of that is that... Um, my version of we have no idea is that our time frame is just so short, you know, so the things that we think are so serious and so big and so threatening and that people lose sleep over, we have no idea. We have really no idea what the bigger picture is. And it doesn't mean don't care. And it doesn't mean don't, you know, work on what's important. 
but it starts with us being sane and whole and grounded and allowing for an in infinite future that we cannot possibly imagine. Mm. Like the, the way I say that is nothing is wrong. We have no mm. perspective to say anything is wrong. This is evolution. Yes, we could do things better. Yes, work on whatever you don't like. Yes, we do all that, but nothing is actually wrong. We don't, how do you, how do you get that perspective? We can improve, let's improve, but nothing is wrong. Don't live your life like something's wrong with the earth. I think we're in a time of very narrow focus with a paradigm of great polarity. And it makes that very myopic. It makes it seem like that's reality when reality is the unknown number of galaxies. That's a reality. Reality yeah. is this whole cosmos. Yeah. And I would like to think that we as humanity who have gone into this very narrow mind could orient that in a way to see a greater lens, a wider lens and, uh, you know, do something about that for ourselves and for each yeah. other. Yeah. On Through the Vine podcast, we like to have our community ask questions. And uh, so I'd like to share a few of those questions with you that I think you guys would be particularly qualified to answer. <laughs> uh, you mentioned nervous system and common is fight or flight and common is the nerves itself. So what kind of tools and techniques are out there to train the nervous system? I know this is your thing, but I'm going to sneak in an answer first. You do. So flight or fight or freeze, right? That um, the whole vagal nerve system, which is the largest nerve system in our body, is uh, for many people, some would say most people, is just perennially activated and in, in play. Um, so the whole idea of how do you relax, how do you tone, how do you stimulate, how do you balance our whole vagal nerve with system, which it translates directly to the nervous system, um, is through stimulation of the vagal nerve. And chanting, which has been around for thousands of years as a practice, has been known to do that. So chanting, um, breath work, all of that actually stimulates tones, balances the nervous system. So that is one practice that impacts the nervous system. And then there are a whole bunch of others. Yeah, I would say the, the, the big uh, thing is to be able to hold a higher vibration. So how do you do that? Well, if you can stand on one leg and close your eyes and look up to the ceiling above you, which I can't do right now, um, but practice that regularly, then you literally hold a higher vibration because your nervous system is being developed. And, and there's a, a, lots of different, that's why I say the eyes, eyes and, and balance are the way you get through the, all the talk to be able to see Am I able to balance in a dynamic world differently? So a lot of one leg stuff, a lot of movement stuff and um, movement. Mo the way I work out, I try to do combine three things, strength, balance and flexibility all, all at the same time. And so much of in, you know, there's so many diseases associated with the nervous system. Right. There's anxiety, there's depression, there's, you know, all of the nervous system, the shaking. Right. All of that is our our dis ease of the nervous system. And so one thing to do is try and eliminate all that stimulus. But that's not actually going to happen. Right. That stimulus is going to keep coming at us. So then the question is, how do I strengthen my nervous system so that I can be with? So I can be in a relaxed state with all of that stimulation. And that, so that's the question that we ask. And then there are multitude of answers. Yeah. Good. Beautiful. Uh, part of what we're doing at Blue Morpho is about sanctuary and sanctuary being a method of practice. And so I'm interested in understanding how sanctuary has impacted your lives. I, I say, I say it this way in my meditation at the end, when I feel like I'm most in the zone, I say I am sanctuary and I, and everybody who comes into my field is going to feel that somehow in their own way. 
And when I'm not being that way, I want to know about it. And boy, does that happen. I get lots of self-feedback about you were certainly not sanctuary and that with that person, Tom. So, you know, uh, so that's how I use it is I'm like, give me straight feedback about when I am and when I'm not, because I want to be that. Amazing. When I feel myself in sanctuary, I am more relaxed and more able to be with whatever comes at me. Um, and so sanctuary has been a almost daily part invoking sanctuary, almost daily part of my kind of meditation and my practice because it sets my state of being yeah. in a way that I feel safe and I feel protected and I feel like nothing can go wrong. Um, and so it sets my whole way of being in the world and interacting with others. Amazing. In 2025, we're going to do another Blue Morpho Thrive, Thrive Blue Morpho. And I'm excited about it. Uh, yes. It's going to be a mixture of ayahuasca and San Pedro, and it's going to be everything that Thrive brings. Would you like to share a little about that for people who might be interested? You should come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think there's not many programs that, that will give you such a big experience with ways to ground it and take it home. And, um, and it's, uh, it, it will be practical, it'll be down home, and it'll be cosmic city. And so that, that the breadth of that whole spectrum is what we're interested in doing is really, 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 really being yourself and really, 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 really being the cosmos. You know, how do you, how do you build a self that can hold that, the, the total extreme of that? That's what we're after. So for people who are really hungry to expand, you know, to expand not just in an experience that they then go home from, but to expand in how they live their life. This will provide an experience and tools to do that. You, you will come home with a, a different identity. You will go home with a different understanding of who you are. You will be not the same in the, in the best of all ways. And, you know, it's, for me, Hamilton, the opportunity to be with you is extraordinary, you know, with your skill and your being and the space that you hold for people. And um, for me, you create that environment. And then what we can facilitate is people being able to land that more deeply in their body and to carry that home powerfully. We're, we're the going home part. You're the cosmic part. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. My favorite thing in my life has been sharing the totality of the infinite with as many people as I can. I love it when people have awakenings to source, divinity, love, universe, God. I can't help it. It's, it's <laughs> what I love to do. Uh, how should people find you, get in touch with you? Uh, yeah. What's the best way? Um, we, we are actually very old fashioned. So we have a website. The website is realevolutionyoga.com, realevolutionyoga.com. So there is, you know, um, a blurb about Thrive on there and people, and you can reach out to us through that. We're not active on social media. I know that's terrible to say these days, but we're not. Um, but anybody who's interested, go to our website Call us on and the, reach on the out. telephone. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, tell Thank you. I'm, over I'm over all this stuff. It's too many algorithms. I want it simple again. Give me, give me a dial phone. Yeah. We like I'm, to keep it simple. Yeah. Real <laughs> evolution, yoga. There's nothing realer. I can attest to the power of Thrive. I think it's a beautiful program, which is why I love doing these together. And uh, the intimacy of the container, the nature of how people get to know each other in the retreat setting. Uh, the skills that you learn are real and practical, and they, I think, are a huge part of how you improve your life along with the plant medicine and sanctuary. So 
I attest it. Please come and join us. I think we're going to have an amazing time. We're going to be up in the Sacred Valley in the beautiful mountains this coming year. So Tom and Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming and being on the podcast. And I look forward to many more conversations and encounters. Uh, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, Hamilton. Hamilton.